Okay then, welcome everybody. Can I, we're going to get start because it's about five past and we've got about 50 minutes worth of material and I'm assuming that the later that I start, the later that we'll finish, which won't make you all very happy. So can I ask if you are sat at the end of a row uh, and the space next to you might just be sensible to move down because it looks as though folk are going to take a while to arrive because you've had a lecture over in Engineering B. So, welcome to Data Acquisition and Experimental Methods. My name is Andy Waitman. I will be teaching you of this very exciting course. Um, you think I'm being sarcastic? I'm not. I actually genuinely believe this subject is fascinating and we can do amazing things. So let's have a bit of an introduction to the module. So after completing this week's lecture, you will have an understanding of how the unit will be taught and assessed, developed an understanding of the relevance of the course as part of your journey to becoming a professional engineer, being introduced to LabVIEW programming for data acquisition, and also developed a theoretical understanding of concepts relating to implementing a LabVIEW virtual instrument. So that's a LabVIEW program, so a computer program. So in terms of the, if you're already sat down, it really help me if you don't talk. It'd be fantastic, just that I find it really distracting. I don't mind if you don't want to be here, you're welcome to leave, okay. So, the course team, that's me. We have a couple of other colleagues who are helping us with this. So we've got Damon Crosby, who's a postdoctoral research associate, who's studying soft robotics with me. We've got uh, Dr. Athia Haroun, who's working uh, with me as well working on medical engineering and robotics, and Miss Lee Tong Lee, who's a, uh, just submitted a thesis all about rehabilitation robotics. So you see, robotics, data acquisition are quite closely related in terms of the skill sets that we need to undertake this, so that's why uh, we are all teaching you. This unit aims to uh, develop an understanding of theoretical concepts of data acquisition, programming skills, so specifically LabVIEW, uh, Discipline-specific practical skills for data acquisition. The skills of conception, design, implementation and operation of data acquisition systems. So this is a technique that came out at the MIT in the 1990s all around. These are the four stages that we do as an engineer. Conception, design, implementation and operation of engineering systems. And we'll also look at experimental design and practical skills. So, why am I talking to you, you may ask yourself. So I'm just going to show you this short video. I'll let you do the reading and then I'll take you a little, tell you a little bit more about it. So as you can see, this is a project that we, uh, we undertook. It finished, when was it, last year or the year before? Just had a paper published in the Journal of Field Robotics, if you'd like to find out more about it. But it involves data acquisition. The whole, what's the engineering need? Um, climate change, we need more renewable energy. Where do we get renewable energy? Plan of permission in the UK for onshore wind turbines has been somewhat problematic. So there's been a massive growth in offshore wind turbines and in fact the UK is one of the world leaders in offshore renewable energy systems. Fixing these wind turbines, identifying when there's problems and just doing that inspection, maintenance and repair is a particular problem. Uh, it's very dangerous. The most dangerous thing you can do in the UK is work at height. Wind turbines are quite tall. The latest wind turbines, the blades are about 107 metres long. Pretty good. And what they do is they have people on ropes uh, abseiling down them to look for problems with these and the blades are moving around so pretty risky things so the idea was can we do with this with robots so we did some sensing with some cameras to see if we can do it and then we moved the robot into the right location um, all done autonomously none of it was remote controlled um, so autonomous boat moves to the wind turbine UAV takes off deploys a robot onto the wind turbine that robot then scampers around the blade looking for problems and trying to fix them so quite an interesting but lots of data acquisition in there 
So uh, DAQ and experimental methods are highly desired in a diverse range of mechanical and aerospace industries. Here's another example for you. So Formula One, impact testing. So we want to know whether these vehicles are safe and whether they meet the relevant standards to be safe to use. So we do a highest energy test. So we do a nose cone with a mass of about 780 kilograms. And what we're looking at doing with an impact velocity of 15 meters per second is to make sure we get an average deceleration here of less than 40 Gs. When we peak above that, that means that we're going to damage the person who's operating that vehicle, and we don't want to do that. So some of the standards that we use for this. Um, so DAQ and experiment methods are highly desired in the virus and mechanical and aerospace industries. Another example, so SpaceX, reusable rocket systems, so we need to do really quite high-speed data acquisition. What does that mean? That means that we you need to run a sample rate where we're running very, very quickly and what we're running thousands of times per second because we need to be able to adjust very quickly. The slower your data acquisition is, the slower that you can apply control signals and move things like thrusters around and the more likely that you're going to get problems with that. So we're going to do high-speed data acquisition and we want to know what the orientation of this vehicle is. And we do that relative to gravity because we know the direction of gravity. If we can measure that with an inertial measurement unit, then we can apply signals to keep it in the right orientation as it's progressing to uh, the landing point, which is some GPS information that we can use. So acceleration data, velocity data, position data, relative to the landing data, all about data acquisition. Another reason why you should be interested, go and check out the previous years of the National Instrument Student Design Contest and some of the cool projects that people are doing using this type of uh, uh, kit. Uh, it might be really relevant for the stuff that you're doing in terms of your third year and, and fourth year group project. So your individual project in your third year, your fourth year group project could be really relevant for those. So why should you care? An appreciation and understanding of DAQ and experimental testing is vital for the development of engineering systems. And you are improving your employability and earning potential. Don't believe me, believe the job adverts, okay? So here's a position at Dyson, and we can see here, cited, um, uh, LabVIEW, programming as need. It's an industry standard for acquiring data used in many, many different areas, from controlling the magnets at CERN to spaceship X and various other things. Uh, also Siemens, the Siemens systems engineers. Also, look, we're saying that we need ability to have engineering principles and theory to develop safe, innovative, and robust products, and that we're after those LabVIEW skills. So that's why we're doing the unit, that's why I'm talking to you, and that's why you should be interested in. What is it that we're actually going to do? Well, our course content then. So we're going to do base concept measurement, signals, signal conditioning. We're going to look at some sensors and some transducers, analysis of signals, so how we may need to do some processing on those signals that we've got from our sensing systems, how we design an experiment, how we do the test plans, um, concepts such as range, resolution, calibration, and so forth. And then we're going to do some LabVIEW programming. So the programming skills that we're going to develop in here is going to use LabVIEW. Um, we're going to be doing some troubleshooting and debugging, implementing a LabVIEW program. So you're all going to implement a LabVIEW program, both in your first lab when you get your hands on with some data acquisition equipment and in your uh, group project, which runs throughout the semester. We'll look at the idea of modularity in programming. We're programming in LabVIEW, but the idea of modularity cuts across all software programming languages data structures, data flow and variables, design patterns, user interfaces, all things that cover in uh, generally in software programming and also how we can input data and how we can save that data uh, and how we can optimise our programmes. So course content then. Each week there'll be some materials to engage with before the lecture. Okay, so we're going to have a blended learning delivery model. Okay, it's really important for you to engage with those. Um, in the lecture, we'll do undertake a different range of activities to support your learning. This first lecture, I've not asked you to go and do all the pre-lecture materials because you only finished your exams last week and today is the first day of the semester. So it would be a bit mean of me to send out an email and say, look at all this before our lecture this afternoon. Okay? But for next week, there's some materials to look online for week one, and I'll release week two materials, and I do expect you to have a look at that as well, because it's really going to help to develop your knowledge. How is it going to be assessed, I hear you ask me? Uh, the practical laboratory, this will be in week three. It's worth 10% of the unit, week three. Check your personal analyzed timetable. You split into four different sessions, so check the date and the time of your first lab. Okay? 
Um, it's, that'll be one and a half hours with half an hour of prep beforehand uh, in, uh, in week three. Uh, at the end of next week, at the end of week two, I will release the group project and that submit will be need to be submitted at the end of week 11. And it's the same release date for everybody and the same submission date for everybody. Again, the cohort is split into four separate um, chunks and within each of those chunks, you'll be assigned to a team and there will be about four people in your team. So it's a group project. So I'll put some resources online about that and I'll also provide you some details about how to work effectively in the group. Let me give you a bit of a heads up though, okay? If you want to be successful in the group project, it's probably not the technical skills that are going to give you that, okay? Never is in group work. It's always about your project management, it's always about your interpersonal skills, and it's all always about how you interact with each other, okay? Who's got a question? Any questions? Yeah, tell me. I'm going to assign group members randomly, yes. Any other questions? Lots of, lots of chattering still. Are you all okay? Would you like me to pause? Are you, got, are you guys okay? With the laptops there, are you okay? Yeah? Okay, great. Let's carry on then. So... Uh, submit at the end of week uh, 11. The examination, so 50% of the unit will be an examination uh, in week, uh, uh, in the examination period. I'm not sure why all the monitors keep switching off, uh, but that will be an MCQ test. Don't be fooled. My MCQ tests are not easy. Okay? Don't think, yay, MCQ. They're not, okay? My job is to uh, um, provide an appropriate level of difficulty for you all. And that's going to mean some of the questions are going to be really quite hard. Okay? Some of the questions are going to be at that level of 40% of the unit about do you understand the basics of data acquisition. So we're going to have a range of them. There will be three online practice tests with full feedback solutions for you all to practice. And I won't, well, won't release those yet. I'll wait later on until we've done enough of the content of the unit. Here's all the dates for your diaries, okay? You should have your personalised timetables anyway, but these are the dates. You'll notice here, you can see uh, up here, this is your practical lab in week uh, three, which is worth 10% of the unit. You'll notice that your group projects are in week, weeks five, week six, week eight, and week 11, where you're going to work in your team of four. In the weeks where we have the group project, there's no lecture. Okay, to balance your time so I'm not using too much of your time and we stay within the unit budget for the amount of allocated time, there's no lecture in those weeks. There's also no lecture in week 12 either, so that we've got a good balance of the volume of activities. You'll notice there's something there called drop-in tutorial. The tutorials you do not have to attend. Okay, I'm not setting questions that you have to do. There's no activities in those tutorials. The idea from those tutorials is you can come along with questions about the group project, about the unit, about something that you don't understand, and you can get some support with it. Okay, so please don't feel that, that you have to attend. Fantastic if you want to attend. I'm going to do those in person. They'll be in person with my graduate teaching assistants, and I'll also set up a link, an online link, so if it's more convenient for you to, uh, to message in, okay, and get some help, then you can do that. So yeah, course we accept at the end of week two, submitted at the end of week 11. So check your personal time table now to see which laboratory session you are assigned to. So each week, yeah, weekly structure materials to engage with in addition to our live session. I'll provide you with a plan to guide you through everything that you need to do. It'll look something like this. For those folk that have already in, um, logged into Blackboard and looked at the unit page, you'll see at the top of each week, folder, there's only week one available so far, that there's an Excel file, and that's just to guide you with all the activities that I expect you to engage with. The idea is you can use that, you can say what you've done, and you can go back and you can look and say, what did I do? Okay, have I done it all? And you can even make little notes about, how did you find it difficult? The idea being, when it comes to the end of the unit, you should have a really clear guide about what you found difficult what you understood and what you didn't understand. And that should really help you optimise with your revision. Okay? 
Uh, we've structured in our lecture. We'll do a variety of activities included but not limited to worked examples, small group breakout activities, recapping key concepts based on your feedback. We'll do some short case studies. We'll do some question and answers using Mentimeter for you to be able to assess your engagement and understanding of the materials. There are a number of ways you can get support. The best way is to ask a question on the discussion board. I do not like answering a question that somebody comes up to me at the end of the lecture or somebody emails with me with. That is not because I am old and miserable, okay? They may also be true, but it's more because if I say, answer your question, great for you, not so good for the rest of you, because you don't know what the question is and you don't know what the answer is. So I would like you to ask your questions on the discussion board and I will answer it there and then you can all see what the question was and you can all see what the, the answer to that question is so everybody is aware of those. So please ask a question there. Ask a question also in the optional tutorial. Okay, you can do that, ideally the discussion board, but if you do it in the tutorial, I'll ask my GTAs to post those also into the discussion forum so everybody can see it. You can also ask a question in the lecture session at the end. I'll be using Mentimeter, so for those of you that don't feel confident to put your hand up and ask a question, I understand that, but I would encourage you to do that because it's the skills that can help you when you're in the industry. Okay, so get used to um, developing those skills now whilst you're here uh, and asking those questions. There's no such thing as a stupid question. Okay, please ask questions. Okay, uh, if all of the above fails, send me an email, or if it's about the group project, you can send Damien an email. Usually my first response is, would you like to ask this question on the discussion forum? Okay, but if it's something more personal in nature to do with the unit, then it may not be appropriate to ask that on the discussion forum, and in which case, please do drop me an email. Okay, um, please bear in mind that I think there's about 450 of you. Okay, I've got 450 of you guys. I've got about 150 students studying robotics, which is also this semester. Um, there's a lot of emails, okay? If I don't reply to you, please don't take offence. I don't reply to lots of other people as well. I can't keep up. So, if I don't reply to you, leave it a day or so, and then send me the email again, okay? If you could do me a favour, if at the top of the emails you could just write data acquisition in your email title, that will just enable me to do a filter at the end of the day and check to see if anybody's emailed me because you guys are a priority, okay? Right, so that's all that stuff. Uh, LabVIEW. Some of you may want to install LabVIEW on your laptops, okay, or your home computers. Fantastic, you can do that. If you go onto the unit page, there's details about how to do it. LabVIEW is big. You're going to need about 20 gigabytes of space, okay? I know, it's quite a big program. And that's partly because, oh my goodness, can you do so much with it, okay? I can take a camera, I can interface with that, I can do control, um, I can do control optimization, I can do um, radio frequency, I can do filtering, you can do all kinds of things, modeling and simulation, you can do so many things, so it's got a lot to it, LabVIEW software. Um, only install the 2019 version of LabVIEW. If you lose, use a later version, it won't work for the group project. Only install LabVIEW 2019. If you've got a Mac, huh, not so good, okay? I've, I've got a Mac, okay? I use a Mac and I've got it installed in here, but it won't work for the group project because network shared variables don't work on it and you need those for the group project, okay? So, even though I love my Mac, okay, as much as it pains me to say, Windows is probably superior for data acquisition. Okay. So, I hope that I explain things pretty clearly for you and it makes sense and you can ask questions. But if you want an alternative way of understanding some of the LabVIEW programming in the unit, one second, I'll come to you. Uh, if you want an alternative way of understanding it, you can look at these textbooks that are available. Go on, sir, you had a question. What? There's no deadline. Yeah. You, you, you don't have to, you can download it and install it at any time that you want. Uh, it would be useful for the group project. I should say, if you don't want to install it, 
LabVIEW is installed on all the clusters in engineering building. Okay, so you don't necessarily need it. If you start doing it and think, this is awful, I'm losing the will to live, I'll just use the computer clusters where LabVIEW is installed, I completely get that. That makes complete sense to me as well. So, any questions on the course so far, or should we start learning a bit of LabVIEW? And I've made up time to where I wanted to be. Any questions? Hi, oh, yeah. sorry, I didn't see you. So the, the, the laboratory, so the group project, okay, I do expect you to attend the group project. I do expect you to work well within a team. And at the end, it will be marked, there will be a piece of code, programming that you've got to submit, and that will be marked. I'll be marking your piece of code that you've already tested and collected some experimental data in terms of how your experimental data looks in comparison to what the experimental data actually is. Okay, so we're doing an XY plotter with a sensor on it, so we'll be marking that. Uh, and there will also be something called a state transition diagram. And if you want to think about what a state transition diagram is, it's a bit like a blueprint for what your code's got to do. And we should develop those before we do any programming. The worst thing to do is to just get that view out and start programming and hope it works. Okay, we need to have a plan. Okay, so three elements of assessment. Um, there will be problems in some groups, there always is. Um, we're using a system for, for uh, rating each other called BuddyCheck, which is developed with an educational framework from Purdue University, and that enables you to all rate each other in terms of your performance and all rate yourselves, and then it uses some statistical analysis to flag to me when there's issues in the team and who's made contributions and who hasn't. And based on that information, uh, at the end, of the, the end of the project, I may have meetings with you, and if you haven't engaged, I may award you a mark of zero. And I did this last semester, okay? This is just me trying to do what I can for those people who are working hard to get appropriate marks, and those people who haven't done any uh, work, well, really, you shouldn't get any marks, okay? So please be aware. You can head all of this out by uh, engaging with each other and supporting each other. Let me give you some examples of things that have happened to me before. Um, students come along, this person didn't do any work. Okay. Uh, how did you communicate with them? They didn't come to the first meeting, so we didn't include them in the WhatsApp chat. Okay. So you excluded them from the group. So yes, they may not be contributing, but you decided to exclude them into the group. What do you want me to do? Okay, so developing these skills about how to work with each other, okay, you may support different football teams. I support Everton. It's awful. It's awful. It's just awful, you know. You may be working with Liverpool fans. That's even worse, okay. You know, so you're going to have differences. Those differences might be your sporting interests, your interests in music, your cultural backgrounds, whatever it is. But it's the same in industry. In industry, okay, nobody cares about whether you like each other if you're in the same team. That doesn't matter. You don't have to, to like each other. What was it, Muhammad Ali, who said we don't have to be friends to be friendly? Yeah, you don't have to be friends, but you do have to organize yourselves to be efficient and effective working in a team to deliver the goal. And that's the soft skills that we're trying to develop within this this um, unit, and they're really, really important. I've got, I've got a minute, so I'll tell you a bit of an aside. The company that make LabVIEW software and data acquisition hardware are called National Instruments, big, global, multi-billion pound company. Um, they employ staff, uh, and the way that they assess people is they do assessment centers, and the technical ones, they'll ask you lots of questions, and if you fail those, that's fine, because they know that they can teach you it. If you fail the soft skills, you're out. Okay, because they can't teach you the soft skills. Okay, and everybody who comes to work for them, they do the assessment center, and then they take them out for dinner. Okay, the dinner is the real assessment. Okay, can this person hold a conversation? Can they fit within the team? Do they have the right interpersonal skills? Okay, these are really important questions for industry and for employers. Okay, the way National Instruments phrase it to me is they're looking for geeks with social skills. Okay, so that's what we're looking for. So we'll try and develop some of those skills within this. So, what is LabVIEW then? So LabVIEW 
is a graphical programming language. It's made by National Instruments, and you can find out all about it if you go to ni.com, this web address. So by, tech, by uh, graphical programming, what that means is it's not text-based programming like you did in the first year in MATLAB. It's not text-based programming if you studied Fortran. Has anybody heard of Fortran? No, it's what I learned to program in. I'm showing my age. So uh, Fortran programming is not even C code, okay? It's visual programming. It's none of those. It looks something like this. In LabVIEW, the program is represented by icons, okay? And these icons are joined together to generate the program flow. And we join icons together with things that we, we refer to as wires. In this example, we're going to generate questions. Tell me. Lots, lots of chitter-tatter today. Can I, I... I really... I don't mind answering questions, but it really helped me if you... Excuse me, sir. Excuse me. Excuse me, sir. Uh, do you have a question? No. Would you be quiet then? Thank you. Okay. It's really distracting, okay, for me. I want to do a good job. I don't mind if you don't want to be here, but please don't talk or ask a question. Thank you. So, icons in LabVIEW, okay? They're connected by wires that show us the process for data bit to be flowed between each of them. In this example, we are generating three numbers, A, B, and C. We're multiplying A and B, and we're adding to the product of C, and then we display it. So that's all we're doing. And we've got an interface on the front panel, which enables us to enter our numbers, and then we just get a display which shows us what the values are. Note here that the data flows from the left to the right. Okay? First view of LabVIEW programming, data flows from the left to the right-hand side of the diagram when you set it up. So LabVIEW can be used for data acquisition that means acquiring data from sensors, including temperature sensors that we might see here, ultrasonic displacement sensors like those that help you to park your car, uh, or light detection ranging commonly known as LIDARs. So here we can see a LIDAR, this is what we have on autonomous vehicles, all of this is data acquisition. Principles of this thing, you have a laser, you spin it around 360, you change the angle of it, you do uh, speed, distance, time calculations, and you can get a point cloud of the world around us. So really important um, for uh, next generation of systems. Not only can we measure sig signals with it, but we can also do some control. So here's an application that we can see where we're doing a control application in our big truck, our vehicle here. It's sensing the distance between the vehicle in front, and then it's when it meets some kind of Pro, uh, programmatical algorithm that says, hey, you're going to hit that thing in front of you, it automatically applies the brakes, okay? So data acquisition is about acquiring data. It's also about control. And in the first semester of your next year, you're going to look at control into more detail. So MATLAB code might look something like this over here. And this is some equivalent LabVIEW code that we see down here. So we've got different structures in here and things. Programming in LabVIEW can mean thinking differently from other languages, and sometimes experience of other languages can be a hindrance in some respects. Although many program concepts may be common to LabVIEW and other languages, others are different and have an impact on how the program is written. It's relatively easy to write simple and functional programs in LabVIEW. As, uh, as programs get more complicated, it inputs, outputs, and parallel processes, a deeper understanding of LabVIEW and how it works is needed. So we're going to cover all of those aspects. Can you put your hand up if you've done some text-based programming before? Okay. Text-based programming, yeah. Yeah? And what, what have you programmed in? C++? C? Python, okay. Okay, yeah, MATLAB, Python. Yeah? Okay. Anybody else? Anything exotic? Anybody? No? Okay. So, programming LabVIEW is called a VI, a dot VI, virtual instrument. That's what we're looking at here. And programs within LabVIEW have two parts to them. We've just seen on the left-hand side here this thing called the block diagram. Okay? And this is where we do our programming. Okay? So, we write our code here. And the thing on the right-hand side is the front panel. And that's the thing that we interact with, okay? It's the part where you set values, okay? Where you can set files to be read. You can do, so that's your inputs to the system. It's also the, the, 
uh, part of the program that gives us outputs. So we may have graphs and indicators in there, and we may have the option to write that data to a file so that we can look at it later. So all AbView programs have two parts, the front panel and the block diagram. Let's look uh, a little bit at the uh, block diagram. So as we can see, when we put the block diagram up, um, you get a functions palette here, and I'll, I'll launch LabVIEW in a second so you can see this. The function palette, this is where you can find all these different functions. You can put them down, and that's how you generate your code. You can also add little windows where you can do some text-based programming in it, and National Instruments and MATLAB have been collaborating for a few years now, and you can take M files, and you can integrate them straight into LabVIEW. And you can just see on the right-hand side all the different types of things that you can do, so connectivity, data communication, signal processing, controls and design and simulation, and various other things. The front panel then. So the front panel, that's what the user sees. Okay? And on the front panel, we use the controls palette to put things down there. So we can drag and drop indicators such as graphs and charts. So let's have a look at what that looks like for the program, that were a, a similar program to the one that we wrote before. Here on the left-hand side, okay, we can see our, our front panel, so how we interact with it. And we've set up a program, and we've created two um, controls called X and Y. And they are, this X is associated with this on the front panel. So when I drop this down on the block diagram, this thing also appears on the front panel. And that enables me to write values into it, similarly with Y. And here I'm just using some mathematical functions to add these two numbers together, and then it's going to display those. So if I run this program now, and I run the program up here by clicking the single white arrow, okay, it would calculate the two values that are entered here, and it would display them. As X and Y are both zero, here it would just display zero. But you've got your first type of thing that you can do with a, a calculator program to add two numbers together. Up here, a couple of the things that I should, uh, sorry, let me go back one. A couple of the things that I should point out to you, this arrow, uh, the arrow, that's the run the program. The one next to it is run it continuously. I wouldn't press that one unless you've designed your program to do that. Usually you want it to run once. You may have a loop set up in there. You don't want it to keep running over and over again. Next to it, up here, we have something called the abort button, so the stop sign. Okay? That is a way of aborting the program. It's very different to abort a program than for your program to be stopped programmatically and it can lead to some big problems, which we'll cover later in the, uh, later in the course. So don't think if you click abort, then it's going to be okay. Let me give you an example. Let's say you've done your group project work, and you've set up your code to collect some data. It's all running fine, and then you click abort. Your program won't have sent any, saved any of the data, because you've just aborted the program. Rather than stopping the program in the code, where it will save the data if you set it up that way, before ending the program. Okay, so the difference between abort and, um, and the program. So a LabVIEW VI example then. So um, let's do a bit of LabVIEW. So I've launched LabVIEW over here. This is the display that I'm going to get. I'm just going to go to File, New VI. And when I create this VI, you'll see that my front panel and my block diagram appear. All I'm going to do is I'm going to go into my block diagram where I do my coding. As you can see, the function panel appears from this. Let me just move that out of the way. All I'm going to do, sorry, let me go to programming, this one. Let's add two things together then. Uh, not strings, <coughs> numeric. Scroll down. Let's take a number. So just add a constant here. I'm just going to control C. Sorry. You can see how I can copy and paste. I'm going to take two numbers and let's add them together from left to right. I'm just going to right click on this and go to create an indicator. And you'll have seen that my indicator has appeared on here. I'm just going to go in here. I'm going to insert some values. Let's do two plus three. Let's go back to my front panel. Make that big so you can see. I'm going to click the white arrow to run the program, and my program has run and given me a value of 5. Okay? You probably can't see that very well from the back. Okay? Don't worry. There's lots of videos online, and the podcast will be online. Okay? So, 
that's our example. Let's go back to the lecture slides. How are we doing on time? Okay. There we go. Okay, so I'll view data types and documenting code. So data types, okay, are, are told to us by colours. So terminals visually communicate information about the data type represented here. So data type is communicated by the colour. Orange here and the text on the terminal, DBL, communicates that this is a double precision number. And a double precision number has 64 bits of computer memory. A double precision number can represent non-integer whole numbers. Okay? So we can see that there. That's orange colour and it says DBL, so we know that's a, a double precision number. The numeric data type represents numbers of various, uh, of various different types. To change the representation of a numeric, you can right-click on it, either a control or an indicator or a constant, and you can select representation, as you can see, see that we've done here, and you can change the data type. Here, i is represented as integer, um, i.e. it's a whole number. The number represents the bit representation. So an i64 that we can see here means it's an, a 64-bit integer. A u means that it's unsigned, i.e. I, it doesn't have a minus. It's always a positive number. Okay. Uh, this becomes, for our course, it isn't so important, but if you end up working at CERN or you end up working down in Cullen doing the nuclear fusion reactors where they control the, um, the, the hot plasma using um, National Instruments um, PXI systems and you've got to do this and you've got to manage lots of memory, then the amount of memory that you assign to things becomes really important. Okay? But we're just going to get familiar with it in this course. So let's have a look at that. So these are the integer ones, these are the unsigned integers. Let's have a look at what that means then. So an i8, okay, if it's 8 bits, that means it's 2 to the power 8 values. Okay, 2 to the power 8 gives us 256 numbers can be represented by an i8. Uh, and in the range of minus, 200, uh, minus 128 to plus 127. The reason why it isn't minus 128 to plus 128 is you need a bit which represents the number zero. Okay, so that's why it isn't symmetrical. We always have to represent zero. Similarly, a U16 is two to the power of 16, which is 65,536 um, numbers um, that you can do. And if that was a, a U, U16, so that's an unsigned, so that just represents a number from zero to 65,535. Okay, so a little bit on data types. We'll get used to it. Uh, green, so green colours represent booleans. Booleans we can think of as true or false or zero or one. Okay? Uh, the behaviour of boolean controls is specified by the mechanical action. So you can think of these booleans a little bit like a mechanical switch. So if you right click on a switch on the front panel and you go to mechanical action, you can set the type of switch that you want. So you could set it to be um, action when pressed, action when released, latch action. It depends on your application as what you want to do. Okay, so you can set that should you want to. We won't do too much on that in this course, but you may want to know that for the future. Okay, so uh, that's just an overview of what we do with those mechanical latches. Um, the next type, those folk who have done some computer programming before, you'll know that the first program that you write is Hello World. You can do that in LabVIEW as well. And to do that, we need to use the string data type. And the string data type, it doesn't look particularly good with this projector, but that should be pink. Okay, so it's pink. If you see pink on a block diagram, you know that it is a string data type. Um, so on the front panel, strings appear as tables, text entry boxes and labels. And you can change the display from shortcuts, um, normal codes, uh, to hex, hex, hexadecimal and password, etc. You can edit and manipulate strings with the string functions on the block diagram. So you can take two strings, you can add them together to create a new string. You can do all the same kind of programmatical thing that you can do with other applications. Uh, a new type of data type for you called enum. So enum is uh, quite a clever one. It's, uh, it's a pair of values. Effectively, it's a string and it's a number. And this example illustrates why it's really useful. Because if you're doing things such as dates in a computer program, okay, really it's a lot easier to do that within numbers 
than to have January, February, March. Okay, so what it does is it just assigns each of the months here is just assigned to a number. Okay, so one is going to represent January and so forth. And that's useful in other types of application. Also, when you're doing your program and you want to manipulate those, far easier to work with numbers. Okay, so an enum data type represented by a dark blue represents a string value and a numeric. So here we can see our strings and here we can see the numeric values associated with it. Let's have a look at the front panel there. So on the front panel, we can see on the left-hand side, we can see January, we've got a drop-down box where we can select that. And what does that look like on the block diagram? It's just this dark blue box that you can see with the same name. Just to note for you here, you can work out that they're the same thing. Is my pointer gonna work? Okay, it's not working. Uh, you can see that on the left-hand side on the block diagram, it says month, and that associates on the block diagram with month. If you double-click on one of them, it will toggle between the two so you can see that. Okay. We'll skip data types example. I'll put that on Blackboard for you. I'm conscious of time and I want to get to things. Documenting code. Documenting code is really, really important, okay? You must make sure that you document the code. You're going to get lots of feedback on that as we go through. It's really important because if I write a computer program, a uh, LabVIEW program, which is really quite long, and then I leave the company, and you join the company, sir, and you look at that computer program, and you don't understand it, you're going to be angry with me. You're going to want to hunt me down and, and have a few words with me. So it's really important to document our code so that we understand what they do. And don't expect that if you write a program and you come back to it, that you won't have forgotten how it works. So documenting code is really important. And we'll look at an example of that. Uh, what you name things is important. Temperature is okay. Temperature bracket Celsius is far better, so you know what the units are. And, and please don't call anything after your cat. Okay, I have seen it. Uh, document code, so here's some examples. You can also label wires, so you can right click on the wire and you can give it a label to show what data is um, within that. Uh, so you can explain what the contents is and you can use the labeling tool to place free text from the functions palette, as we can see here. So here, this is a, uh, uh, that's labeled in a wire and this is an example of some text to explain what's happening in this code. And we can go through that. So you use the following guidelines, document algorithms that use add reference information, label structures to specify the main functionality, label long wires to identify their use and contents, and label constants to specify the nature of the constants. Uh, while loops, let's touch on this briefly, I will put this on Blackboard. So concept of a while loop is that you repeat the code until some condition of the code is met and then you end that. And this is pseudocode, okay, so it could be C, it could be MATLAB. A flowchart of this process looks something like this. This is one of the most fundamental parts of the course, by the way. Um, a flowchart, so here we can see that visually. We've got some code. We say, has this condition been met? If it hasn't, we repeat the code and we keep going around and around in a loop until that condition is met and then the loop is ended. And the way that is displayed is using this piece of uh, lab view code that we can see on the right hand side. So this is called a while loop. You can create that on the block diagram if you right click and you put that down. You put the code that you want to execute in the left hand, uh, in, the, in the bubble that you can see there. And there's a couple of little points that you need to notice here. So you can see in this example uh, here that we've got a little I on the bottom left hand side here. That's called the iteration terminal and it tells you how many times the code is executed. It is executed. It's zero indexed, okay? So the first time the program runs, it starts on a zero. The second time, a one, and so on. So it's zero indexing in lab view. The condition terminal, that's the Boolean logic which just decides whether your program's going to finish or not, okay? Now in this example here, it's just a stop button that you've got on your lab view interface. So on the front panel of my program, I've just set it up. When I click run, it's gonna run over and over again until I Click that switch and it stops. Okay. There's also another uh, type of program called a for loop. I'll just introduce that very quickly and then we'll finish because I can see that the, we're almost on time. So another type of programming structure is called a for loop. Rather than operating until a condition is met, 
This one, we're just going to set the number of times that it's going to execute. So here the pseudocode says n equals 100, so we want our code to execute 100 times. We've set our counter value i to equal to 0, and then we're just going to ask the question, is i equal to n? So have we reached the number of executions yet? If the answer to that is no, we're going to repeat our code, and we're going to do i is equal to i plus 1. So this is going to incrementally increase the value of i until such a point as i is equal to n, and then the code's going to end. Okay, so two different types of structure. One, which carries on doing in some type of condition is met. Either we press a stop button, or somebody moves through a light gate, or, you know, there's an emergency shutdown based on something that's happened, the temperature gets too high, or something like this, where we want some code to execute a set number of times. That's what it looks like in a flow diagram. So n is equal to 100. Is i, equal to, I is equal to 0? Is i equal to n? No. Execute the code and then add 1 increment i by a value of 1. Is that executed? It? Yes or no, and keep running around in that loop. Uh, lab view, that's what it looks like in lab view then. So you can see i is your iteration terminal again. Again, it's zero index, so it starts at zero. Um, the code is executed, and we've set this, the difference between this structure and the previous structure is up in the top left-hand corner there. You can see a value y to the um, to the n, and that's the number of times that you want the code to execute. So just like this left, left hand side here, we said execute 100 times, and the LabVIEW code is going to execute 100 times. So that pretty much finishes the time that we've got available. There's only two. Hold on, hold on, hold on, before you go. If you, if you could ask your, who's teaching you for dynamics? Ah, okay. I'll have a chat. I'll have a chat with Professor Wang, and I'll ask him to make sure that you finish on time. Can I just ask you? Okay. Right. Everyone, sit down. So. If you could wait till I finish, it'd be much appreciated. People have been talking all the way through the lecture. If you want to talk, come and have a chat with me. I want to teach you. If you don't want to learn, leave. Okay? I'll see you all next week. Who, sorry? Oh, okay, okay, brilliant. Okay, oh, okay, brilliant, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, that's great. Thank you. Oh, yeah, you okay? Yeah, uh, I have a few questions regarding uh, what uses, uh, uses. Yeah, tell me, what's your questions? Um, for, for the group work, right? Yeah. Please, you want to come to the oh, end? Oh, just, like, just so I, uh, I'm locked out, so you can, uh, you should be able to.